So in the previous video, we looked at how climate can be the most significant factor in the distribution of organisms. And as we're studying biomes as a whole, we're going to be looking at climate in much greater detail in the next couple of flowcharts. So we'll entitle this next flowchart, Climate 1. And again, for the most part, when we're talking about biomes, which I'll define in just a minute, we're going to be focusing on macro climate, large scale observations all about the climate. And when we think of the term macroclimate, we have to automatically understand a key concept behind one of the driving components behind climate as a whole. And that would be the idea of solar energy. This is something we've covered before, quite briefly in photosynthesis, but it's showing up again because it's a running driving factor of the entire macroclimate that we see in an, in an entire biome, which we'll define in just a minute. Solar energy really poses itself as an important factor because of what we consider latitudinal variation. And specifically, latitudinal variation in solar intensity. So we have this variation in solar intensity because of latitudes. And what we'll understand this by is by stating that the Earth is curved. And a very easy way to understand the idea of solar energy and latitudinal variation is to imagine a curved Earth, much like this. You see a globe, and what you'll see in the middle is one line usually, and that line usually represents the equator, right, at zero degrees. When we create more latitudes, like I'm doing here, above and below, and maybe another one above and another one below, these are latitudinal variations, variations away from the equator point. And thus, we have different solar intensities at the top, at the bottom, near the middle, near the equator, and so forth. This is something we'll look at when we continue studying solar energy. Furthermore, we can understand macroclimates, large-scale climates, by understanding these latitudes, these latitudinal variations as well. More specifically, something like the tropics, an area, a region that many people are familiar with, are specifically located at two distinct uh, latitudes, let's say, at 23.5 degrees north all the way to 23.5 degrees south. What we mean by this is 23.5 degrees north of the equator, 23.5 degrees south of the equator. So you can imagine the tropics being this region right here all the way up to this region right here. So this colored area that I'm showing you would be the tropics, let's say, quite close to the equator, and you can imagine the consequences. In this area, we have direct sunlight. We all know that the equator gets the most sunlight, but if you have an area near the equator, like the tropics, it will get the most direct sunlight. And if you get more light, you automatically will get more solar energy and thus you will get more heat in these regions. And because you have more heat in these regions, it's going to be usually more heat than other regions as a whole. So it's always in reference to other regions and we're just going to write that down. More light equals more heat um, than other regions. Furthermore, if we look at the higher latitudes, let's say, the ones that aren't the tropics, the ones that uh, like are over here and over here, let's say, these higher latitudes will have different macroclimates because they have different solar intensities based off of the solar energy that we're studying. Here we would obviously observe less sunlight because we're further away from the direct sunlight that hits the equator. We would have more diffuse sunlight so it would be much more spread out, much less direct, let's say. And then the overall consequence would be that we would have cooler temperatures. So that's key here. How far are you from the equator will definitely coincide with the amount of solar energy that you receive, which will then coincide with the amount of sunlight you receive and the temperatures that you have in that region. Furthermore, we can look at a concept of like solar radiation as well. And in order to understand solar radiation, we'll start off with a basic definition of the concept. Solar radiation. And this is still a part of solar energy, just a different idea. So what is solar radiation? We can consider solar radiation the idea that initiates global air circulation. So we're going to be meteorologists for a second. Global air circulation. This is what weather is all about. Global air circulation 
and also because you have air circulating you will also have what we consider precipitation patterns basically the weather all the weather that we observe is based off of solar radiation and thus we have precipitation and we have air circulation furthermore this is all in context of the region that we're studying of the latitudinal variation that we see if we imagine that the solar radiation is initiated near the equator so let's write that down initiated near equator it's a good starting point a good starting point for solar radiation because we have the most sunlight there we have the most direct sunlight we imagine that near the equator air would heat up so we'll say air heats up because we have a lot of sunlight so we're gonna look at air circulation patterns if the air heats up what we naturally imagine based off of basic physics and thermodynamics is that the air will expand and as the air expands you automatically know that with expanding air comes rising air so we have expands plus rises after it heats up furthermore this will then flow toward the poles so flows towards poles and what we mean by poles are of course the north and the south poles over here so as this air is getting higher and higher and expanding more and more we're going to have different weather patterns let's say for example as air rises we know that it actually will be cooling and this is because when you're getting closer and closer to these polar regions to these poles you're going to have this cooling effect so as air rises it cools and as it cools it will release water content so we'll say releases water content that should already look look back at our definition precipitation patterns that's what's going to come out so it releases water content and thus we will have lots of tropical rain so where would we have lots of tropical rain within the tropics why would we have that because we have a lot of light we have a lot of heat we have a lot of direct sunlight and thus we have a lot of expanding and rising and we have this releasing of water content all near the equator what's near the equator the tropics as stated over here now let's imagine we go uh, over the equator much further away from the equator let's say let's imagine we go over about 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south if we go let's say just far from the equator like these lower points here let's imagine what's gonna happen here what are the global air circulation patterns the precipitation patterns that we observe here here what we actually notice is that air doesn't rise it actually descends so air descends and then air is usually dry because it's descending when we say that air rises it gets close to the water and then we say that precipitation happens but if air descends air is dry and if air is dry it usually absorbs moisture basic meteorology here basic weather pattern here you would expect in these regions not to be tropical not to be full of rain but because we have the absorption of moisture because we have dry air we would of course have deserts in this area let's imagine we go even further away from the equator let's imagine we go over 60 degrees north and 60 degrees south so we're going even further away from the equator what do we expect here uh, what happens again is that air actually takes another rise it rises again and as air rises again it cools and whenever air cools you imagine that it releases water that's how rain works rising and cooling will release water and that's at the 60 degrees north to 60 degrees south a uh, little bit higher a little bit further away from the equator than previously before and then finally the last one that we'll do right over here uh, since I ran out of space we'll do over the poles so let's imagine we go all the way to the polar caps of the earth over here air sinks and if air sinks we're going to have it flow back to the equator flow back to equator so again we are looking at solar radiation which initiates global air circulation the rising the flowing the descending all of these things that we've covered and then that results in precipitation patterns that we've just observed finally the last thing in this first part to macroclimate is the idea of seasonality so this is something we are quite familiar with as we live in a very seasonal temperate climate and this is all due to the following. 
Seasons are due to Earth's tilted axis. Earth's tilted axis of rotation. This is what's going to give us our seasons and also the Earth's annual passage around the sun. Annual passage, that's this orbit that happens around sun will give us our seasons. The key idea here is this tilted axis. If we're tilted further away from the sun, then of course we'll be colder. We won't have le more direct, we'll have less direct sunlight. If we're tilted further cl oh, towards the sun, we will obviously be warmer. These are seasons, okay? And because of this tilting, we get strong seasonal cycles, but these cycles are usually limited to a certain part of the earth. Strong seasonal cycles in middle to high latitudes, like in New Jersey, for example. Middle to high, L-A-T-S, for latitudes. And usually the tropics are actually unaffected by this. That's why the tropics are always hot. That's why they're always raining. That's why their seasons are non-existent altogether. So we have these cycles like spring, winter, summer, fall, whatever, because we are located in the middle to high latitudes of the earth. And thus, we will experience, because of the seasons, different day lengths. We're very familiar with this, the idea of short winter days and long summer days. We'll experience different solar radiation. Thus, we'll experience different temperatures, hot in the summer, cold in the winter, because of the different solar radiations that happen. And then we also, of course, due to that, just like I mentioned, experience different temperatures. So as we can see, through this idea of macroclimate, a lot of it is based off of the Earth and its geology, the way that it's shaped. And then that in combination with solar energy and solar radiation gives us very important macroclimate patterns that we've observed.